Hey folks, David Stewart here. I wanted to talk about this little piece of, for me, nostalgia right here. This is Vampire Hunter D. This is the first novel by uh, Hideyuki Kikuchi, um, illustrated by Yoshitaka Amano. And if you don't know who Amano is, uh, he actually is the main concept illustrator for a lot of the Final Fantasy games. So his art, you've probably seen it before outside of uh, the Vampire Hunter D novels. But I wanted to share this one a little bit, partially because as a book, it's a very interesting thing to look at, especially now that I've got a lot of time separation from when I first read it. And also to talk about Vampire Hunter D as a character and um, I guess a universe and why I have so much affection for it. So uh, long before this book was translated into English for me to read, I knew what Vampire Hunter D was because of an anime that was made in the 80s and I originally saw on the sci-fi channel when I was a boy and it really excited me. It was it blew me away in fact when I was a kid because it was a animated movie that was far more violent than I was used to and had a different approach to aesthetics than I'd ever seen even with other say Japanese animated shows like Voltron or something like that. It really was something very, very special to see and to look at back in, I don't remember when I first saw it, in the early 90s. However, what really excited me was the universe that um, that D occupied and lived in. And of course, they came out with another movie later on called Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust here in the US, which I could talk about a little bit. But uh, this original anime really blew me away with this strange world that they'd created where uh, it takes place, it's a sci-fi horror universe. It takes place like 10,000 years in the future after vampires have essentially taken over the earth and then subsided to humans. And so it's in kind of a human dark age where people have returned to medieval and previous ways of life while at the same time being supported by this advanced technology that the vampires have created. That's all kind of the background of this, um, but it creates very interesting aesthetics to look at because you have castles but castles that are technological they're like you know computer space castles and that's what i saw in the anime this uh this book is what the original anime was uh was based off of and it was the first one to come out in the u.s and as i was looking at it uh looking it over to make this uh, video I, it has a little teaser for the second book for volume two Razor of Gales, uh, available August 2005. So I'm assuming I bought this like in 2005 or something like that because I do remember buying volume two right when it came out. If you're wondering about the size, it's this, I think it's called A6. It's the same size as a as a manga. So there you go. Um, kind of interesting. And I actually like the proportions of this. It's like a six by nine proportion, but smaller versus compare it to say an eight, eight and a half or eight by five. And you can see the eight by five just has this kind of taller look and I like this more square look a little bit more. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about the story that's in here and how this is constructed. Because this was written originally in Japanese and you're reading a translation, there's some quirky things that are either to be dealt with and overcome or to enjoy because uh, it comes from a different writing tradition than English. Now, all the story elements are there. So if you're looking for a way to execute story in, on a broader scale, it's all there and it's a great story. The, the heart of the story is a girl gets bitten by a vampire and is basically going to turn into a vampire unless D can uh, can kill this vampire. So there's the, the conflict that's set up. There's a bunch of little things that impede him on the way to that goal and things that you know accelerate that goal. And while he's doing that, you get a good exploration of the world and you get a lot of good character interactions. Um, of course, with this very alluring and mysterious, almost bad boy character called uh, D. Now, the quirky things about this, there's a couple quirky things about this. First of all, uh, it's told in a what might be considered in the English tradition a third-person omniscient perspective, meaning the narrator is aware of all of the details that are transpiring rather than having a narrator that's focused on the perspective of one character. This is a style that's kind of fallen out of favor in um, English novels in the last couple of decades. It's not one I have any problem with because I tend to read a lot of older books too, but it's one that kind of has fallen out. But another quirk of, uh, I guess, the way that um, 
uh, that Hideyuki Kikuchi really approaches writing is that there's a lot of auxiliary information that's presented in. There's what you might like people might say telling rather than showing. Um, so, you know, he will tell you not just how somebody's feeling or what something means, but he'll give like a little comment that like, this was the sort of absurd method of killing only a dumb peer like D would be capable of. Well, that's kind of like a weird little interjection of commentary among the pros, but it's scattered throughout the book and it gives it an interesting flavor, a very different flavor from what uh, a novel would be if it had written been written in the English language to begin with. Um, and that's something that I, I think is kind of interesting to look at if you are thinking about checking this out, is that because of the way that it's constructed in just a different tradition, you end up with a lot of these different quirks that you probably wouldn't see in a normal English novel, Novel because an editor might say, yeah, you know, you don't really need to give that commentary you should show rather than tell. But it's just part of that, and um, I actually don't, don't really mind it at all. Some other things have to do with the, uh, the method of translation. So if you guys know... Or if you if you follow say video game localization, one of the things that tends to happen, or say like anime dubs versus anime subs, where you subtitles versus overdubbing it with with the spoken actors, one of the things you notice is there's often a difference between the two, and that's because the subtitles tend to do a more word for word literal translation, whereas the the dubs tend to filter it through a lens to make it seem more idiomatic to an English speaker or, say, a North American English speaker, somebody from the, U the U.S. or Canada. So that's something that I think exists in this translation. There is sometimes it seems very literal in that it's not very idiomatic. And at, at other times, it seems like there's uh, idiomatic elements that are just kind of put into it. You know, it, it seems it's clear that you know, somebody wouldn't write that in Japanese, that that's a, a modern um, English kind of way of saying something. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that as well. I personally am much more interested in the direct translations. I feel like if you try to filter what's there and make it highly idiomatic, now it could be very idiomatic in Japanese, and so a direct translation doesn't doesn't make that much sense to an English speaker. But to me, when you're trying to do a lot of... Um, you know, I don't want to call it slang, but you know the way that an English speaker talks, it can it can feel awkward sometimes. So there's that existing in a couple places. Now, for the construction of the book, let's talk about the setting, characters, and plot. I talked about the setting a little bit. Now, the way that the setting is really exposed is quite interesting. Uh, he does a major, major info dump in the second chapter. It's right here. Uh, it's called uh, "People of the Frontier," right? The year is AD 12,090. The human race dwells in a world of darkness. Or perhaps it might be more accurate to call it a dark age propped up by science. All seven continents are crisscrossed by a web of super speed highways. And at the center of the system sits a fully automated cyber city known as the Capital, the product of cutting edge scientific technology. The dozen weather controllers manipulate the climate freely. Interstellar travel is no longer a far fetched dream. In vast spaceports, hulking matter conversion rockets and ships propelled by galactic energy stare up at the Empyrean Vault, and exploration parties have actually left their footprints on a number of planets outside our solar system, Altair and Spica, to name a few. However, all of that is a dream now. Take a peek at the Grand Capital. A fine dust coats the walls of buildings and minarets constructed from translucent metal crystal. In places, you'll find recent craters large and small from explosives and ultra-heat rays. The majority of automated roads and maglev highways are in shambles, and not a single car remains to zip from place to place like a shooting star. Notice he's talking in the present tense. So most of the prose flows in the standard past tense that we're familiar with. But in other cases, there's a little bit of a mixture of tense here. So he's talking in the present tense. There are people, tremendous mobs of them, Flooding down the streets in endless numbers, laughing, shouting, weeping, paying their respects to the capital, the melting pot of existence, with a vitality that borders on complete chaos. But their garb isn't what you'd expect for the masters of a once proud metropolis. Men don shabby trousers and tunics redolent of the distant Middle Ages, and threadbare cassocks like a member of a religious, a religious order might wear. Women dress in dim shades and wear fabric rough to the touch, completely devoid of flamboyance. It goes on like this. Now, this info dump is interesting. So the, the way that it's constructed 
is the beginning starts with the conflict uh, called a cursed bride. That's the first chapter where this girl stops vampire hunter D stops D and he's riding on like a cybernetic horse, I think. Um, and basically explains that she's been bitten and he's got to solve this problem. Then chapter two, you have this info dump, which is purely just explaining the setting. Now, a lot of, a lot of debate with the writing circles is how much info dumping should you do? How much direct ep exposition ought you to do? Is direct exposition bad? Right now, the current trend is no direct exposition. I, however, don't mind this direct exposition at all, especially the way it's executed. Hopefully you like the way it sounds because it is just telling you about a setting which is itself incredibly interesting. And because it's doing it directly, it's isolated down to just the most important parts. And what's also important about, uh, about that info dump is that by explaining everything about the universe in point blank directly, it really sets up uh, this odd, I guess this odd placement of the, the main villain, this vampire Count Lee, named after Christopher Lee, by the way, who, who uh, Kikuchi's a fan of, as far as I know. Um, so it's named, after, it's named after him because he is still acting as a lord, a vampire lord, even though all the other vampires have been kind of usurped by people and have gone away or died or something like that. So it's, it's kind of interesting and important that all of these elements are put fairly early in the book. Now, I think it's okay to do direct exposition like this if you have an interesting story and an interesting universe to talk about. In fact, I actually prefer this sort of info dump, uh, especially how well it's executed, compared to really kind of half-assed indirect exposition where you're dropping important little elements like in prose, in between dialogue. Um, there's a lot of writers that do that now, and often it comes off as awkward to just kind of try to place that in there or even worse to have characters talk about a setting that they live in. I think that that's actually far more awkward than just having direct exposition. I say just talk about the universe and let the characters act normal and natural rather than trying to explain to each other things that they already know. What I call expositional dialogue. Expositional dialogue is very awkward to me. So rather than have that, he just tells you exactly how things are. Um, this strict stratification of vampires and humanity came about when in one day, 1999, so far in the future, mankind's history as lords of the earth came to an abrupt end. Someone pushed the button and launched the full-scale nuclear war. Notice we're back in the, in the past tense. It's interesting um, how he uses those tenses or how the tenses are used as part of the translation here. Um, so because of that's so interesting, I think it's preferable actually to doing indirect exposition in this case, especially when you have something that's like, we need you to know it's 10,000 years in the future. How are we going to come up with a scene where people awkwardly talk about what year it is, you know? Um, so I, I actually like the, the direct exposition quite, uh, quite a bit. Now, that's the setting, the characters. Um, the main character here is Vampire Hunter D, and he is really the focus of, of all the volumes. And what makes him an interesting character is that he is basically a paragon, but he is portrayed as a bit of a bad boy. He's a damn peer. He's a half vampire. So right away, he's half blooded with the things which he's killing. And this is brought up often. He's very stoic, um, which can be very attractive. And of course, he's highly skilled as a killer. Um, he's super resilient. It's very hard to kill him. Uh, and he has two layers to his personality, one which is outward and is very stoic and um, almost standoffish in a way. And then an inner one where he actually cares about people for their own sake. Uh, but he doesn't let that inner side show all that often. Uh, but we do get this interplay between him, you know, taking a job and him actually caring about saving this girl and um, having a relationship with her younger brother, which he's often accused of doing. Now, he's also interesting because he has a parasite living in his hand. So there's a talking parasite, which is kind of um, kind of acts as like the devil on the shoulder. It's it's a reminder. It's, he's always reminding D about reality. Um, he's always trying to tempt him to go one way or the other. So it kind of acts as like an inner monologue for D, but just voiced out loud. Um, and it's one of the things that you see in like the, the movies and stuff is, uh, you know, like hold up his hand and there's a face in it and it, it talks to him uh, and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's a pretty cool 
That's a pretty cool little addition to what he was there. And there's always this mystery of like, what does D stand for? And by leaving that mystery there, it makes him a more interesting character. We wanna solve the mystery and keep reading the books. Um, so it's a really good mix of that, uh, besides the fact that he's you know always described as being like physically attractive and tall and things like that. Um, the other characters, the you know, the, you have the damsel in distress, you have the best friend who's actually, the, in this case, like a little boy who develops a relationship with Dee. Then you have a cast of villains. Of course, you have the big bad villain, which is Count Lee. And then you have um, some other kind of mutants that work for him. Uh, one called Ray Jinsei, um, uh, Jinsei who's, who's able to like warp space around him. All of them have like superpowers. So you have kind of like a, a superhero element in that. So it's kind of like there's X-Men walking around in this world working for the vampires, which is kind of fun. Uh, now for the plot, you have a basic conflict, then you have a bunch of little events that impede that conflict, um, and a bunch of people trying to stop D from, from solving this, and then you know you finally have a resolution. So it's a pretty straightforward plot. I, so I think somebody, I don't remember who said it, it might have been Brian who I had on the show uh, the other week, uh, all plots kind of reduced down to wavy lines, and so this one's kind of like that. It's not... Uh, it doesn't fit into like your three act plot or anything like that. It's it's a really good plot. E each twist that happens, you feel like it's a little bit surprising. The solutions that uh, Vampire Hunter D comes up with to overcome the problems always feel like they are original, but also not out of nowhere. So um, it's pretty good. I have a lot of nostalgia for this. It definitely is a little bit weird because it's not in the original language. And so unlike a graphic novel, which I think translates pretty well, um, even without the dialogue, you're you're kind of left with trying to translate that prose in a way that's going to make sense to an English reader and and I do justice to the story. So the story elements are good. Uh, the prose might be a little quirky because of the way it's composed, but I actually kind of like that. I find I find it more original than like standard writing. So anyway, I hope you guys uh, liked this little analysis of Vampire Hunter D. This is the first one. Um, I don't remember how many I have. But uh, at some point, I, I stopped buying them. I don't remember why. I think because they started to get a little bit repetitive as, as the series went on and on. But anyway, so thanks so much, and I'll see you guys next time. Oh, yeah, my fantasy novel's coming out November 1st. Make sure you pre-order it. Link will be down below. It's high fantasy, but there's also guns. And uh, I'll talk more about that um, in a little bit. I'll see you next time.